My name is Nathan. I am the Connection and College Pastor. If you do not know who I am, we are back in the series through the Psalms. Not back. I guess we were in it last week as well. Continuing in this series through the book of Psalms. Go ahead and turn to Psalm 101, either in your Bibles or your devices, wherever you uh, read uh, the Word of God. Turn there now, Psalm 101. I don't know if you guys realize this or not, but including today, we have eight weeks left of our Psalm series. Everyone go ahead and pat yourself on the back. You have almost made it through this daunting task of going through and walking through the book of the Psalms. One thing I want to do before we jump in is I want to make sure that we all know that the resources that we've been giving out since the beginning are still happening. And so we have a Bible reading plan that we have. And even if you're just joining us, you can still jump into that. Um, and that's a Bible reading plan that we walk through all of the, every single Psalm in the book of Psalms, as we don't get to do that here on a Sunday morning. Uh, there, we also have something called the Weekly Digest, and that is a collection of questions for every single Psalm that we as pastors write throughout the week to help you with your quiet time as you journal, or even if you're in a home group or a community group, it helps you with maybe discussion um, and things like that. But we want to make sure that we are still utilizing these resources to get the most out of this series of Psalms as we have time left in it. So we are in Psalms, specifically Psalm 101 today. But before we do anything else, would you all just take a moment and pray with me and also pray for me? Let's pray. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are in this place, that you promise us that you are with us wherever you go, that you will never leave us nor forsake us, God. So today I pray that as a people, as your people, we would be receptive to what your spirit has for us today. Um, God, we would be receptive to what your text and your word Jesus has for us today, Father. And I pray that your will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven Um, God, I pray that everything that we're bringing in here today, our weeks, uh, uh, the fights, uh, anything like that, anxieties that we have that we're bringing in today, God, um, we would be able to still hear your voice clearly speaking to you in the midst of all the other noise that our life brings. So God, we thank you. We love you for this time and opportunity that we have to learn more about who you are, what you have done, and how much you love us. It's in your name we pray, and every single person said... Amen. Amen. All right, let's start today by reading Psalm 101 in its entirety uh, as to get a bigger picture. And one quick thing about Psalm 101 as we're reading, and this will be important, is that it's broken up into two sections. Hebrew poetry does this oftentimes is it'll run parallels with each other so that the first half is similar but not the same to the second half. And so verses one through four are broken up of the standards of the king, the standards that a king should have for himself. And then verses five through eight are the standards that a king has for for his people. So let's begin reading Psalm 101, verse 1. He says, Psalm of David, I will sing of steadfast love and justice to you, O Lord. I will make music. I will ponder the way that is blameless. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall be far from me. I will know nothing of evil. Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. I will look with favor on the faithful in the land that they may dwell with me. He who walks in the way that is blameless shall minister to me. No one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. Morning by morning, I will destroy all the wicked in the land, cutting off all of the evildoers from the city of the Lord." What a happy, joyous psalm. Aren't you guys happy that you guys came to church today? No one tried to sneak out yet. Just hang with me. But I will say that since this psalm talks about walking with integrity and being honest, I will be transparent with you all today that this psalm has been the most challenging passage of Scripture for me to ever work through and in turn preach. It's challenging for a couple of different reasons. One, it's challenging because it's what we would call a royal psalm. So it is a psalm written by a king instituted for all kings who would follow and come after King David. It's also, well, yeah, so none of us in the room, unless one of us today is the princess of Genovia in the room today, there are no kings or queens in the room today, so is it, it's not exactly written specifically to us. It's also challenging because of the time that it was written in and where it was specifically written in. David writes this in a government that was set up as a theocracy. So there weren't just themes of the religion in the constitution like America is. Uh, there were the, the whole government was centered around their religion. Their government was their religion. And finally, it's challenging, I think, because of the language David uses. He says things like, I will destroy, I will not endure, 
No one shall dwell in my house. They shall not continue. I will destroy all the wicked. I will cut off all the evildoers. And when we see words like this, it makes, us hard to, it, it makes it hard to comprehend a God that is both full of wrath and justice and also mercy and grace. So we see this psalm and we see texts like these and we try to hold it up next to our life and say, well, I'm not a king or queen. I don't have a, a king ruling over me. We don't live in a government that's set up like this. So does this really apply to me? And, and at times I think we just dismiss passages of scripture like this and say, Jesus fulfilled this so it doesn't apply to me anymore. Slap my hands and walk on with my life, right? And while I empathize, I, I empathize with that a lot, there's tons of texts throughout scripture that it seems very hard that it would apply to us. Things like in Leviticus, where they, you see people waving chickens before an altar as an offering to God or cutting throats of goats. And I'm like, well, God, I don't think I'm supposed to be doing that right now. That usually means that you're something else in this world if you're still cutting the throats of, of, of goats and things like that. And so does that really apply to me? Should I just read Leviticus just to get a gist of the fact that thank you, Jesus, that we don't have to do that anymore. And thank you, Jesus, because I would pass out every time I was, would be giving an offering to God because I hate blood. So thank God for that. Or what about numbers? Do we really have to read every single name in those genealogy? Let's be honest. Who here has never read every single name in those genealogies? Just raise your hand. Let's just see where we all are at. Put them up proud. Yeah, I have never read. You have read every single name in those genealogies, guys? Oh, we were talking about integrity today. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Anyways, so we read that and we say, do I really need to read every single name through the book of numbers or should I just get a gist of the fact that our God works in the midst of details? Where we see a psalm like 101, we say, does this really apply to me since I don't have an earthly king or I'm not a king? So when he's talking to kings, should I just kind of ignore this and say, thank you, Jesus, doesn't apply to me? While I empathize with those feelings, what I know to be true is that every single book, passage, verse, and comma in the Bible teaches us more about who God is and what he has done. And that is absolutely instrumental to our faith because our relationship with God is only as deep as our understanding of him. So if you have a shallow understanding of God because we constantly pass over passages like these that are hard to wrestle with, then in turn, we will have a shallow and surface level relationship with the God of the universe. So I pray that after we're done with today, you see something in Psalm 101. You see three things. I pray that you see something important about a characteristic of who Christ is. I pray that you see how we are to live our life in light of the sovereignty of God and I pray that you see a picture of grace that could be easily missed in the midst and talk of judgment, destruction, and cutting evildoers off. So I'm excited to be with you all today. Let's start back in verse one where we see David lay out the standards that a king should have. He starts in verse one. He says, I will sing of steadfast love and justice to you, O Lord. I will make music. That a king should value that which his God, who he is in a covenant relationship with, values. That he should be consistent in his character, he should be loving in his character, and he should be ruling with perfect wisdom and truth, which is justice. That that's what a king should do. Verse 2, I will ponder the way that is blameless. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. That a king should be perfect, blameless. That if you looked at a king, you would not be able to see any spot of blemish upon him because he is absolutely blameless and a man of integrity. Verse three, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. That a king should be so fixated on God that anything or anyone that would try to pull his attention away from God, he would cast away and know nothing of it. And finally, verse four, a perverse heart shall be far from me. I will know nothing of evil. That in his relationship with God, a king should be so perfect a king should be so blameless that he has, doesn't even have a recollection of what evil is. These are the standards that David says he as king and every king to follow should have. But in these standards, we see an underlining theme. We actually see every single thing pointing to a specific standard that a king should have. And that is, I will walk with integrity of heart. Bracket that in your Bibles, underline it, start, whatever you want to do, that integrity is the most important thing when it comes to being a king. Everyone say integrity. Excellent. We hear this word a lot. We see this word a lot, maybe in your jobs where your boss is telling you that you should work with integrity, not cheating the company out of things that you're not doing, being honest about the work that you are doing. We see it when coaches use it for athletes. My swim coach always used to say, "Be have integrity about the laps that you're swimming because he's not counting those laps. So if we say we swam, swum, swim, swam a certain amount of laps, then we should have actually swam, swum, swim, swum those laps as well. 
And then my dear friend Aaron, who's a college community group leader, he says that it's, he's, he's British. He says it's one of the six core values of the British Army. So if the British think it's important, it is absolutely important to us today. So what is integrity? If you look up the definition, you'd get words like complete, pure, perfect, undefiled, and plain. But if we look at what biblical integrity is, as David is describing it here, we see that it is a pure consistency that someone lives their life with so that the person they are in public is the same person they are in private. David says that integrity is knowing the right way to live and living that way in every facet and aspect of your life. And I cannot think of anyone more important to have integrity than a leader, someone who is dictating laws and judgments, someone who is enacting judgment out in the world, someone who is calling and causing other people to uphold standards. They themselves should be upholding those standards first before they call anyone else to do it. A leader should be so perfect that we could trust that leader with our life if it came down to it because we knew that they were perfect, they were blameless, they have pure intentions and motives, that they are someone who walks with integrity. But the problem in these first four verses is that while these are the standards of the king, Every single one of these kings, including David, were imperfect sinners. It's a shocker, right? Like, who would have thought that leaders of countries would be imperfect sinners? And yet David was imperfect. He was extremely imperfect. We see an example of this in 2 Samuel. I won't read it for the sake of time. But we see an example where David is in his own home, the place where he says a king should be practicing integrity first, in his own home, and he looks out of his window and he sees a woman by the name of Bathsheba bathing on the roof, and he says that she is beautiful, and because he is king, he can command whatever he wants and he will get it, which is why it's really important for a king to have integrity. And so he commands for Bathsheba to come to him. He commits adultery with her, but he doesn't just stop there. He then tries to cover up this sin by then sending her husband to the front lines of a battle where he knows that he will die. And in one act of taking his gaze off of God, as he calls every king to do, and putting it onto something that is worthless, like an act of committing adultery, he breaches his own integrity. And in this breach of integrity, it then causes a public distrust of him that then later, five chapters later, his own son Absalom takes advantage of, raises up a rebellion, and splits the nation in two. It is absolutely instrumental for a king to have integrity because once trust is lost in the public eye, it is that much harder to gain back. So King David says that these are the standards that a king should have. But my question that I have here is David is not stupid. David is wise. So why would he set standards for a king so high that he knows that even him, he himself will not be able to fulfill those standards? Why not just make them lower? And I think because David knows two things, or David here is doing two things in these first four verses. He says, one, just because godly standards are too high does not mean we lower them to our level so that we can achieve them. He says that a king should be striving for the highest level of holiness because that is the right way in which we are to live both in public and private. But what he's doing here is actually something much more important because what he's doing is giving us today in this day and age the picture and the proof of what the king will look like when he comes. See, with King David, there was something established called the Davidic covenant, and that was that anyone in the line of, that that David's line would rule forever over God's people, over the nation of Israel, and now God's people, whoever believes in Jesus. And so David here was establishing these four verses so that we could hold it up to every king that would follow David and say, is this the promised prophesied king? And be able to say, no, they are but poor reflections of the king that is to come. It's a prophecy we see in Isaiah 11, 1 through 5, that mirrors the first four verses of Psalm 101. I want to read Isaiah 11, 1 through 5, where he talks of this perfect king that is prophesied of. He says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord." This king shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his eyes hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wickedness. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. 
the picture that is painted here and the picture that David presents to us and institutes for every king is the picture of the Jesus. A man who came to this earth of the line of David, who had a responsibility by the father to do certain things, to live a certain way, who walked this life blamelessly and perfectly to the point of dying on a cross for our sins, who then is now raised to life and at the right hand of God the father, practicing and enacting justice with all mercy and love and perfect wisdom, that this is the picture of Christ as not only our savior today, but also our king. And just as King David had standards for his people, so our King Jesus has standards for us. And hear this today, Jesus is king. This is the picture of Jesus as he has upheld all things perfectly. And whether or not we recognize him as king of our life does not change the fact that he is king of our life. He is king. Whether or not we call him king or not, he is king. King and he calls us to live a certain way. So how do we live our life as God's people? And what we find in verses five through eight, as I said, it was a parallel of it. So think of that as we're reading, starting in verse five of Psalm 101. He says, whoever slanders his neighbor in secret, I will destroy. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. Look at the parallels of this. These are all things that are done in private that are not seen in public. It is a lapse of character in both public and private. And so the way that we are to walk as the king's people is the same way that the king himself should walk. And that is that we are to walk with integrity. Keep going. Verse 6. I will look with favor on the faithful in the land that they may dwell with me. He who walks in the way that is blameless shall minister to me. No one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. Jesus says that under his rule and reign, there are only two ways to live, either in recognition of him as your king or not in recognition of him as your king. You can either walk with integrity as him as your king or you can, he says, practice deceit. And he actually starts off with the wrong way to live under his rule and reign first in verses six, or sorry, verses five, when he says things like, don't talk about people behind their backs. Don't be prideful or arrogant, thinking of yourself perfect. Don't look at others as if they are much worse than yourself, when in reality, you are lying to yourself about where you are. And for me, that instantly brings to my mind a group of people in the New Testament that fits that description perfectly. And actually, Pastor Matthew, during our time of giving, already mentioned them, and that is the Pharisees. They were this religious elite that were notorious for looking down on others, holding people to standards that they themselves could not even hold, and doing it so not out of a, a genuine want to uphold those, but out of a superior or superiority to those people. And Jesus has something to say about them in Matthew 23, verses 25 through 28. It gives us a good picture of what it looks like to practice deceit and in turn not live in recognition of Jesus as our king. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. The opposite of walking with integrity is walking in hypocrisy. The Pharisees were men who practiced deceit in such a way that they presented themselves in a way that was not honest to who they were themselves. They wore robes that would show their merit and status so that they could flaunt it to those around them and then put others beneath them. They memorized scripture not so that they could understand God more and have a greater love for God or have a greater relationship with God. They did this so that they could hold it over others and recite it back to people in public and say, what do you know? I imagine that the way that they prayed was similar to how Jesus describes the person who doesn't necessarily say, God, save me, a sinner, but is someone who looks up and says, God, thank you that I'm not like that person. They presented themselves as someone who has made it, no longer needed God, and that God should probably just go help someone else who actually needs it. And yet what Jesus says is that they lived a life that practiced deceit because while they looked perfect on the outside, There was rotting and decaying bones on the inside. This is what it looks like to practice deceit, to present an image that is not accurate to what is really on the inside. Can we talk about dishwashers for a moment? 
Okay. Who here has a dishwasher? Raise your hand. Perfect. I know I'm talking to the right crowd. This is going to apply to us. See, look at that. We all have dishwashers. Whether it's an actual machine or a person who you tell to wash dishes. We all have dishwashers. In our marriage, mine and my wife's Cassie's, our, one of our biggest disagreements by the blessing of God has been how to load a dishwasher. Anybody else have that same? Wow, we have, this is going to really apply. Or roommates. It doesn't have to be a spouse. It can be roommates too, for sure. Um, here are three tips for you if you are dating someone and you want to see if that is someone that you could marry for the rest of your life. Do three things. Build a piece of furniture from start to finish with that person, okay? Instructions included. Two, eat a bowl of cereal next to that person. How someone eats is very important that not a lot of people think about. My jaw pops every single time I eat cereal, and my wife literally says she's going to throw up if she continues to hear it. So I have to eat cereal in a different room if, I already, if I'm going to do that. And then third, load a dishwasher together and try to work together. If you can make it through those three things, you have found a keeper, it doesn't have to, you don't have to be like line up on everything. Just if you can work through it and you still love that person afterwards, marry that person, okay? But Cassie and I load the dishwasher very differently. And because we load the dishwasher very differently, there are two different results to that. I load the dishwasher like this. I take my plate when I'm done eating and I walk over to the trash can. I just do like one of these, bada bang, bada boom. And I bang it off the trash can and then I just throw it into the dishwasher, right? Because it is a machine that it says washes dishes, I no longer have to wash that dish, Dixie. I no longer have to wash that dish, okay? Because the dishwasher is what I paid a couple hundred dollars to do the thing that I no longer want to do. And that's all I do. So if there's bits of food on it, who cares? The dishwasher's got it. If there are smears and shrieks of food down the sides of it, who cares? Dishwasher's got it. Who here loves a dishwasher like that? Be honest. Thank you. Come on, yes, I knew we were gonna have some. Now my wife does it a little bit differently. She takes her plate, she walks over to the trash can. She scrapes everything meticulously off. She takes that plate over to the sink, turns on the water, sprays it down so there's nothing on it, then takes the brush in which we scrub other pots and pans that can't go in the dishwasher, and she scrubs it completely clean so that this thing is already without blemish on there. The only thing that she's missing is putting soap on it and putting on a drying rack rather than just throwing it in the dishwasher. Who does it this way? Raise your hand. No need to clap about it. No need to clap about it. Okay, there's no wrong way to do it, but the results are drastically different. Cassie's dishes come out clean 100% of the time. Mine, I would say, have a good 40% success rate. <laughs> I now know, though, what dried, hardened avocado looks like. I know what ooey-gooey egg looks like, right? But here's the thing. Maybe you say, well, Nathan, when you see that, what do you do? Do you uh, go to your wife and you say, Cassie, I was wrong. I'm going to do it your way now. Your way is so much better. I don't even know what I was thinking. I would say you think too highly of me. What I do is I take the plate and I sneak it under the bottom of all the other plates so that I don't have to face the judgment of Cassie and I can pretend like that plate is clean. Okay, now you're saying, Nathan, I don't want to come over to your house. And I say, that's fine. I didn't want you to come over anyways in the first place. But here's the problem, and here's where we'll get back to the main point, is that I can pretend all I want that that dish is clean. I can hide that dish away so that no one ever sees it, but eventually that dish will be discovered as not clean, but in fact filthy. In fact, yesterday when I was prepping this sermon, I was in my office, and my wife walks in holding up a plate and goes, Nathan, what is this? And I said, you're never going to believe what I'm preaching on this Sunday. <laughs> It was perfect. It was like, God, thank you. I know I'm supposed to put this in there now, right? And it's a, it, this is the reality, is that we can pretend things are clean all we want. This is the same with our relationship with God, that we can present ourselves in a certain way or hide things in a certain way that makes it look like we are clean. We can post things on social media that make it look like we have the perfect marriage. And man, we have this Hollywood relationship. We just never get sick of each other. And I could look into her eyes forever and never get sick and tired of it, man. All the time, even in the morning, when the breath is like decaying, rotten blown bones of the inside of the Pharisees, right? Or we can present our, our families in a certain way that, man, my kids never fight. We just have this great old time, and we are just, we are just cheaper by the dozen. Well, no, that was actually a pretty chaotic family. What's a Brady Bunch? Is that a better one? Brady Bunch family, that, man, we're just living life perfectly. Or we can post on social media our, our quiet times and things like that that make it look like we were spending time in the Word for two hours. And, man, we had the incarnate Jesus Christ sitting across the table from us, and we were just having this incredible dialogue and just going back and forth with each other. And, man, it was incredible. 
Don't get me wrong, social media is incredible and I think that it can do a lot of good things, but I think it has created disorders, dysphorias, and anxieties and comparisons that never needed to happen so that we look at somebody else and we go, man, I wish I had their life. And so we start to lust over the material possessions that other people have. We start to lust over other uh, men or women that are presenting themselves in a certain way. Man, we start to wish that we had a certain life and start to become discontent with our own life. We start to view ourselves as less and so in turn, we then present ourselves in a perfect way so that others would think the same of us. Or maybe we present ourselves in a certain way by doing something called faux vulnerability. And that is always talking about what you struggle with, but it's always in past tense. Yeah, I really used to struggle with porn, but now I got a hold on it. Man, I really struggle with pride, but I'm, I'm good now. Or, I mean, I really used to struggle with, with these sins of my life, but I, it was a used to and not a right now. Vulnerability is not talking about things that you used to struggle about. Vulnerability, true vulnerability, is talking about the things that you are going through right now. Because otherwise, an image gets presented that is not accurate to the image that is in us. We do this at church, too. We present ourselves in a certain way. Put on our Sunday best. We walk in the doors and we feel like in order to be accepted, we have to live a certain way. And I pray that when you walk into Hope Fellowship, you do not feel this way, that you have to wear something that, that doesn't show any sort of skin over your own face and that you're worried about someone's gonna think about you if you have screaming children as you walk in through the doors and you're like, oh my gosh, I am so sorry. I pray that this is a place where you can bring everything that you are through those doors and not feel or get judgment, but get love and mercy and someone to walk alongside of you. I pray for that, but if it's it's not, then shame on us for creating that culture and we can do better. Because a church should be the place that we can come in and be our authentic and true selves saying, hey, I am messed up, but that's why I'm here. We present ourselves in a certain way and I think our society is creating something like that where we feel this intrinsic need and desire to present ourselves in a way that is not true to who we actually are, but which is why the Psalm series is so important because if you read through the book of Psalms, you'll see that the psalmists are not scared of how they are presenting themselves. I mean, they will put everything on display, their anger towards God, their doubts of God, their imperfections, and they will put it all on display without any thought of what they are going to look like. And therein lies the beauty of the way in which we are called to live as God's people. That we are to walk with integrity, recognizing that integrity is more about honesty than it is perfection. It's about saying, I don't have it together, and I messed up. And we pause for a moment to communicate the danger of this because yes, integrity is about honesty and not perfection, but honesty is not enough. I, I can say right now, man, I am a terrible person and go out and live in public like I'm a terrible person, but that's not integrity just because I'm doing both inside and outside. David says integrity is knowing the right way to do it and doing it in both public and private. Honesty is the beginning of living truthfully, but just because we are honest does not always mean we believe what is true. So in order to walk with integrity, we have to know what it means to live in truth, to walk by truth. And the problem is, is today in our day and age, there are so many different truths and truth has become subjective to the individual. We hear things like, do what seems best for you, follow your feelings, get in touch with yourself, do what feels comfortable. Or one of my personal favorites is that we are told to do what makes us happy. I've, I feel like there are people in prison who did that. And the problem is that these attacks are not coming from outside of the church. I would expect it to come from outside of the church. The problem is that we are hearing this more and more in the faith community. That we soften the offensive side of the gospel and in turn we miss out on just how incredible God's grace is towards us because of what we deserved. We say, man, if it feels right in your heart, then God is telling you to do it because God is not a God of confusion. So if you feel good about it in your heart, then do it in, in public because that is what we are called to do. We focus on grace without talking about judgment. We talk of heaven without ever mentioning the idea of hell. We take passages in scripture that are hard to stand by and we sum it up to, it was a different time. It was written to a specific church or it's in the Old Testament and in turn we twist and change scripture to make us feel comfortable about how we are living or it makes us fit our, we make scripture to fit our agenda or we make scripture to fit our way of thinking. Man, love everyone, just not that person. Grace is for all, but if you do that, that's pretty unforgivable. 
Honor the king. Man, unless we don't like that king. God's standards, the way in which he calls us to live, were not meant to control us. Or they're not created by a societal construct to control us. They were created and instituted by God so that by walking in them and through them, we would experience true freedom, true joy, and everlasting life. And yet we take these standards that God has put in place and we mold them around who we are rather than taking ourselves and molding them around the truth that is God. Listen, just because we can't keep these standards doesn't mean we lower them. David knew the standards and he did not lower them. We strive for the highest level of holiness in our life and what that does is it creates a weight in us. Last week, if you were here, Pastor Mark did a 10 commandments test and I will tell you what, I was sitting there just feeling so hopeless and helpless because I felt the weight of my inability to fulfill every single one of those standards. I was saying to myself, I have broken every single one of these in one day. I thought I had not murdering on lock until he talked about that it was also hating someone. I thought I just was like, I'm never gonna murder someone, so I'm good to go. There is a weight to the standards in which God calls us to live as his people because they're supposed to be. We're supposed to recognize that there is no possible way that we can do it. We're supposed to recognize that God cares more about our character than he does the comfort in which we live our life. And yet here is the beautiful reality is that under the rule and reign of King Jesus, things look a little bit different. John 14, six, Jesus says to his disciples, I am me, Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way. I am the right way to live life. I am the truth. I am the truth in which we are to walk by, and I am the life that by walking with me and in me, you will find life. In one clear sentence, Jesus lifts the weight that the old way of the king had by saying that the way we walk integrity is no longer how perfectly we live our life or how well we live that life that is the right way. It is by whether or not we are walking with Jesus. It is a new way of doing things that doesn't just mean that uh, having this new king doesn't mean that we no longer have standards for us so that we can go out and live however we want. It's that he has fulfilled the standards for us so that when we fail and we inevitably will, we are still seen as righteous and blameless and perfect. It doesn't make us shoot for anything less than holiness. It relieves the weight though that the call of holiness puts upon us, recognizing that the only way I have any chance is by actually not any way of myself, but only through Christ. So our honesty looks a little bit more like this. God, I am a sinner. I have fallen short. There is no thing that I can do that can help me get back to you. It is only by you and your grace, just will for me that I can come into your presence. That's integrity. That's blamelessness for us today. We have a king who has standards, and hear this part today, who has fulfilled them for those who submit to him as king. We have a king. He has has standards for us, and he has fulfilled them for those who submit to him. Believing is one thing. Submitting is an entirely different one. I know a lot of people who say they believe in God, and yet they still are in complete control of their life or what they think is complete control of their life, and they have given nothing of themselves to God. Believing is a great and necessary first step, but the The thing about belief in Christ as our Savior is that with that belief in Christ as our Savior comes a submission to him as our king. Because the reality is is that if we never submit to Christ, if we never deny ourselves and pick up our cross, then there is a consequence. 
verse 8 of Psalm 101, morning by morning, I will destroy all of the wicked in the land, cutting off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord. At some point, I think we've gotten away from this again because we don't want to sound like we have a megaphone and I am with that all the way. And yet I still feel the need to say because of what is in scripture that there are consequences for how we choose to live this life. There are consequences for what we choose to submit to. It doesn't make God cruel or mean. It doesn't make him unfair. It makes him just. Earlier in the week when, like I said, this was the most challenging sermon I think I've ever prepped for in my life. When I get stuck in certain thoughts, I usually just go to Cassie and we have a conversation about it. And so we were talking about it and she was just talking about basic questions that she had about the text. And one thing she said really has stuck with me since Wednesday. She said, where is the grace? Where's the grace in all of this? It's hard for us to see grace with words like destroy, cut off, and judgment, but grace is found in the judgment of our king. Without judgment, there is no grace. What is grace? It's getting something that you did not deserve. What what did we deserve? We deserved dudgeon. So if there's no judgment, there would be no need of grace. Grace is found in the king who has created a different way for us to come to know him, to walk in this way of integrity rather than practicing deceit, that when we are in him and only when we are walking this life in him will we be seen as righteous. And the beauty is that that is not anything that we can do. It's all that he has done and does do for us today. This concept of in Christ can be difficult at times and I think it still puts this responsibility on us at times, I think, that we have to walk in Christ. I kind of view it like this. I heard a a Matt Chandler, I think, actually did this. And he said, he has no power to fly, and yet he can get into a plane that can. And that's how I view walking in Christ. I have no power, no power to redeem myself. There is no inner qualities within me that is some some sort of able to will myself to, to salvation but I can be in one who has those qualities. So here's some questions that I wanna ask. And if you would just close your eyes, just to get the distractions out of here, bow your heads, close your eyes, put your posture towards a king who deserves us to be bowing down before him. Do you believe in God as your savior? Do you believe that Christ came, lived a perfect life and that has died for anyone who would believe in him? If you believe in him, have you submitted your life to him? Have you given every aspect of your life, your kids, your schedule, your plans of the future to him? walking with integrity? Are you striving for the highest level of holiness and yet you are not presenting yourself in a way that is perfect? You are living the same in public as you are in private. Or are you practicing deceit? Are you presenting an image out of fear of judgment or failure? Presenting a perfect person because you think that that's what's required. I pray that you see that his grace and his new way is infinitely better than ours, that his truth is not control, but it's freedom, that his life is filled with more joy and hope that is never ending and life everlasting. Submit to him today. Give your life to him today. We pray for a moment. God, we come to you in full recognition that we are undeserving of all that you have revealed to us to be. God, we come to you today asking forgiveness for the times when we have taken control. I stand here today, God, and I recognize and confess to you that it's hard to give up control and to trust you completely with my marriage, with our future. It's hard for some of us in the room today to give our kids to God, 
saying, God, they are yours. God, I pray that as your people, we would live in complete submission to all that you are. That we would live in submission to who you are and in that submission, find a freedom better than any other thing. God, we make lousy kings and queens of ourselves. God, you can take care of my marriage so much better than I can. God, you can take care of my future so much better than I could ever plan for. God, you can take care of kids better than any parent could ever take care of kids. So God, we give you our life. We give you control. God, I pray that if any of us are unable today, that we would come to you in submission, kneeling, whether that's in your seat or at the altar, saying, God, I give you everything as not only my Savior that has made a way for me, but my King who declares me righteous.